Um, I started my social media or content creation journey in medical school. And that's just because medical school was so heavy. It was really difficult. And I needed something that was mine and something that I would enjoy doing. And again, I wanted to pursue that creative aspect in me without the pressure of like, it's a full-time job or anything of that nature. I mean, not even like I had those opportunities, but I wanted to be able to pursue those things and to see where it took me. And I mean, I guess over the years it's grown and um, I think I've become better at it. From the Lucha Podcast Network, this is the Mass Startup Podcast. The Mass Startup Podcast profiles the most talented creators, impactful entrepreneurs, and high-performing professionals with the purpose to drive insights, learnings, and tactics to help you build the things that you believe in. I'm so excited to have you on. Um, We've already had like a really cool chat so far, so I'm hoping that the podcast is even better. (laughs) It will be. Um, Just to start off with, um, please introduce yourself. I'm Nosipo Mflanga. I'm a medical doctor, content creator, influencer, I guess, whatever you want to call it. And yeah, I'm just trying to figure out, figure out my way through life. And what was the journey for you to getting to this point? Yo, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> Is it like 10 years worth of work just yeah, like compressed almost, in a one almost minute answer? Eight. So I um, always knew I wanted to be a doctor. I was like top of my class, one of those kids. But I think I was like a little bit arrogant because when I applied to university, I applied to one place because mm. I was just like, I'm going here, I'm not going anywhere else. And, you know, this is what I want. I didn't get into that one place. So now mm. I had to figure out how to get into medical school, which I did. So I spent three years doing a BSc, one year doing an honors, so four years at UP. And then I got into the graduate entry medical program at WITS, um, which is like a if you have a degree, you can apply for medicine and you get into third year. So I started medicine in med school in 2016, finished mm. in 2019, and now I've been a doctor for three years. So That's really impressive. But yeah. also, like, what does it take in terms of mentality to have the patience to do all of that and sure. get to this, like, oh, yeah, now I'm actually doing yeah, the work? Yeah, I think for me, it was just like one of those things where I knew it was my purpose. I was set in knowing that I couldn't do anything else or I wouldn't be fulfilled doing anything else. So I wasn't too scared or like deterred by how long it was going to take me and how long it was taking me I just knew what goal I had and because Mm. I'm religious and I really felt like this was a purpose that God had given to me I figured that he'd like help me through it because there's no way you're gonna put this in my heart and not help me get to it because that doesn't make sense and he did so I persevered and I'm a doctor now and what's that like it's Ups and downs, ups and downs. Good okay. days, bad days, but I, it's still a very noble profession. I mean, I'm honored to be a doctor. We get to help people. We get to meet people at their worst point and, you know, try and save their lives in whatever way we can. But as you can imagine, it's also quite dark um, mm. because it's about disease. People are sick, people are dying. Mm. Um, so there can be some heavy days. But I think at the end of the day, if you are passionate about it and you do the best that you can, you sort of find a way to be satisfied with the good that you do, even though they are some tough days. Sure. And what do you do to get through the tough days? <laughs> and I want to talk about like the <laughs> toughest, I yeah. think, you know, that COVID period, lockdown yeah. period was yeah. probably like, yeah, tricky. I, I'm sure they don't prepare you for that. No, <laughs> right? I don't think anyone is <laughs> prepared for that. <laughs> so let's start with just like, you know, on average, yeah. what does it take for you to handle that side of it? Um, honestly, I would say, Contrary to what I think people would think, doctors and healthcare professionals in general have very bad coping mechanisms and very bad mental health. Mm. It's just a space that doesn't have support in it. Um, I think people just expect you to figure out a way and make a plan, get yourself together, get to work. And unfortunately, for most of us, that's how we cope. You just shove it all down and get to work. Because, I mean, even if you've lost a patient five minutes before, if someone else comes in needing your help, you can't sit there being like, no, I need to process, I need to grieve, you need to step into action. So, if anything, I don't think there's a plan and there isn't a specific way that somebody prepares themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you just learn to figure it out as you go. But I do think with 
more chats being had about mental health and things like that, it does help people to speak out. So for me, the support system that I've had in my family and my colleagues, um, especially in internship, because most of the people I was in internship with were in medical school with me. Mm. So that was not as difficult as it probably would have been because we were a family. So mm. it made it a lot better to deal with. But I definitely can say that healthcare professionals don't have functional coping mechanisms. We just, for the most part, just push through. And that's scary. It is very scary. So, you know, this pandemic happens, yeah. right? And I, I mean, you know, people talk, actually we'll get to that later. Yeah. What was it like being a doctor and that experience yeah. during, you know, the height of COVID and, yeah. you know, so much happening in that yeah. time? So COVID hit when I was in internal medicine in internship my first year. And internal medicine sort of is like where all the people with respiratory illnesses, where all the COVID people would come. Mm. So that was very overwhelming. I actually fell into a deep depression in um, internal medicine. I had to take antidepressants. I didn't handle that well. But I think over and above just the sheer load of COVID in terms of patient load and how much work it made for us, the emotion around it and the fear, I think, for me, was the hardest bit because we were all going to work, but all of us in the back of our minds had to keep that, mm, if I, I get COVID, mm. does that mean I'm going to get very sick? Am I going to make it? Because our colleagues were also dying, so it's not like it was just the patients that were losing their lives. Our colleagues were losing their lives too. So it was very scary. Um, I don't think it's anything that anyone can be prepared for because it's yeah. not something that's happened in years. We haven't had a pandemic in a very long time. But I don't think we could have been prepared for it. And I mean, over time, we did figure out a way and find ways to make it work. But it was definitely a heavy time. And I think even now, a lot of people are still recovering from the remnants of COVID. Business, the economy, a lot of people are still suffering from the remnants of COVID. Mm. Things have pretty much gone back to normal. People are living their lives. But I don't think we're fully over it. Um, and I don't think with us, like healthcare professionals, the experiences that we've had, I lost a very close colleague of mine who was sick, went to a hospital, he was in ICU, everyone was happy the day before, they said he was getting discharged, and all of a sudden the next day he had died. And I got COVID personally three times during the pandemic, so I also had a lot of tough moments where I was worried about, because one of those times I was very sick, mm. and I also was afraid for my life as well. So it was a very tough time, and I don't think any of us want to go through that the, again. The, the scary thing for me is just how... I haven't heard enough of these experiences of healthcare professionals yeah. during that time. Yeah. And the experiences that you had versus, say, you know, just, you know, general people just yeah. thinking differently about what it yeah. was, what was actually happening. Yeah. Can you describe just, you know, the experience of being a healthcare professional during that time versus, yeah. say, you know, the average person on the street? Because yeah. I think we have this view that's just like, oh, man. It won't affect me because yeah. I'm just like outside of it. Yeah. But you deep in the trenches of yeah. this and you seeing people on a daily basis, just like, you know, being affected by the soul, like graphically. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, one of the hardest things, I think, which would have been a big contrast between the lay person and the healthcare professional was people acting like COVID wasn't real. I think there's nothing that upset me mm. more than that because all the conversations people were having about this whole 5G and microchips and all these random things mm. and how we're all making this up and COVID doesn't exist and we were risking our lives literally because at that point, especially in the beginning, we didn't know how this was going to play out. So we also all were just going to work hoping for the best. But I think for us, it was really terrifying because as much as everyone else was skeptical, we had to go through it, but still had to show up at work. And I think another thing that I also found very upsetting from the general public is how even when we were asking, for instance, please wear masks, wash your please hands, stay home. you know, curb the spread. Because again, obviously, over and above... COVID being something that was making people sick, the more people were sick, the more overwhelmed we would be. Because, I mean, South Africa is a majority, um, it's a third world country and the majority of our population lives in poverty. So that means the majority of them are going to be accessing public health care. Mm. So if they got sick, the places that they would be coming to would be the places where we work. So the more of them are sick, the more work for us. 
the more tired we are, we're already wildly stretched thin in state. Mm. Um, so it was very difficult to try and manage that. And then on the back end, people are saying they don't want to wear masks, they don't want to do this. But at the same time, it's like, you guys shouldn't be complaining about working. You have a calling. This is your job. This is mm. what you're supposed to do. But it's just like... Yeah, but you can't have it both ways, though. Like, you can't pretend that this thing doesn't exist. And then mm. you're still saying we shouldn't be speaking out because we should be okay with risking our lives. I mean, we're human, too. We have families. We have people we care about. And even that was something that was so difficult because going to work meant I have stayed at home most of my internship career. Um, going to work means... I could go to work, pick up COVID, come home. My mom and my aunt both have hypertension and people with comorbidities were the higher risks during COVID. I was also afraid of infecting my family. And yeah. I think people forgot that we were also human with extensions of us that we cared about. And over and above caring about other people, we cared about our own lives. So mm. I think the experience of COVID for us was shocking in the sense that you had to accept that it was real whether you liked it or not because it was staring you in the face. I mean, there were... People coming in in distress, we were running out of oxygen, no places to put them. You can't tell me that that was something that was made up. Because if it was fake, I mean, surely we all would have been sitting there like, oh, no, there's no COVID in the hospitals. We're mm. all fine. But that wasn't our experience. It was a very real, scary and just devastating experience. And when you think about just like the amount of information that was out there to say, you know what, guys, this is real. Yeah. Staying at home actually helps. Yeah. Wearing a mask is so important. Yeah. Washing your hands yeah. is critical. You you see all that information out there. Yeah. And you guys are healthcare professionals still also just saying, hey guys, look, mm. this is real. Mm. This is happening. Mm. You need to adjust the way you're thinking, mm. the way you're living, mm. the way you're just existing in the world. Mm. Mm. Um, what was the thing that really like frustrated you with that sort of pushback where people are going, no. Yeah. This can't be real. <laughs> because for me, it's just like, you know, you, you hear these things and you go, okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, for me, I had, you know, someone that I knew, you know, um, very early on, yeah. sort of the first two, three months when yeah. things were getting really hectic, mm. pass away. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. oh this is real. Like, yeah. You have to understand yeah. the gravity of the situation. Yeah. yeah. And that's not what it should take for people. Yeah. To be conscious of something yeah, like this. Yeah. But I mean, I think, honestly, I think it's the nature of the human condition. Human beings are innately selfish. I think we generally go out of our way to, you know, try integrate and live with people and care about other people and all of that. But we usually look out for number one. And I think a lot of people, the thing that was making this not real for them was that they didn't have any first-hand experiences with COVID. Mm. And even when they did, because there was a spectrum, that was another thing that was really difficult to manage, was trying to explain to people how it's different for different people. You might get COVID and it's like the flu, which was my first experience of COVID. The second time I almost had to be admitted, there's a spectrum. It isn't mm. just because you had like flu symptoms and you were okay that this is a fake thing. People were not understanding that because it doesn't affect me or it hasn't affected me, this is a real thing that's affecting other people. And I think over time, especially I think with that Delta wave where a lot of people, I think that was the wave that had the highest death toll. Mm. That was probably the best time that we were winning with getting the message out. Yeah. But that's just because every week, everywhere, it was rest in peace and condolences so a lot of people had now somebody who's like second degree third degree very close um to you that had an experience of someone who had died from covid someone who got very sick from covid we had some prominent people pass away from covid as well so i think that sort of made it more real for people mm -hmm. but i really do think that the difficulty there was just that people in their minds were like it doesn't affect me so it doesn't exist or I'll choose to live like it doesn't exist because it hasn't affected me. Mm. And obviously we go through this sort of all these cycles yeah. and all these lockdown in and out and, you know, then vaccine hits mm -hmm. and the, the misinformation is like at an all time mm. high. And I think Yo. like you, you're not very conscious mm. when you, you know, um, just a lame person mm -mm. that look, man, there's no, uh, incentive yeah. for entire nations yeah, yeah. to harm their people. Yeah. You know, when the vaccine came in, yeah. did you see sort of people's minds change about yeah. what this was and 
you know, being willing or open to also just going, okay, if this is the solution to yeah. end this, you know, very morbid period, yes, yes. difficult way of living, you know, we could get back to whatever normal is. Mm, mm. Did you see people's minds change? Yes, I did. And I think this again, in a weird way, I think in the beginning, especially when uh, the vaccine chat came up, um, I saw a lot of people leaning towards the side of there must be a conspiracy. This doesn't make sense. First COVID happens and then after COVID happens, now all of a sudden there's a vaccine that they pulled out of their back pockets. Where did it come from? And it's just like, but <laughs> these are the things that I find so strange because, again, human beings being like selectively blind and mute and whatever, mm. it's like when somebody comes up with a new phone, the iPhone 14 came out and they're telling you that, oh, it can do this, it can do that, it does this, that, and the other things that maybe phones didn't have before, you accept that, you're happy. Oh, yeah. You're like, oh, no, cool, oh, yeah. I'm going to go buy an iPhone there's, 14. There's no mistrust yes. of the new technology. Yes, somebody's like, oh, people are like, oh, here's a self-driving car, and you're like, oh, yeah, cool, cool. I yes. mean, that could end really <laughs> badly. That could end very badly. If yeah. That self-driving car can't actually do it properly. That mm. could be the end of your life. But people will be like, no, cool, yeah, I trust that, that's fine, I, I don't care. Panado, we get off the shelves. You don't know where it comes from. Mm. You're not too sure what's in it, but you drink it. Most people drink it. I mean, everybody, I think, in their lifetime has, like, drank a Panado or some sort of painkiller. Mm. You trust them, you drink them. But with COVID, it was just shocking how people were just like, no, there's no way that this vaccine is here to save us. This vaccine has an issue. There's something wrong with it. And over time, with, you know, trying to spread... Um, more accurate information, positive information, trying to work out the kinks in people's understandings. I did see a shift more towards the positive where people were um, more open to taking the vaccine. And again, the vaccine chats started a lot during Delta. It was actually mid of the Delta wave, mm -hmm. which was the most deadly wave. So that also helped a little where, and because that was close to the vaccine rollout, it helped a little because now it sort of inspired fear in people, I guess. And mm. this was a solution where we were saying this won't keep you from getting COVID, which is also like a big, big misconception with the vaccines. People didn't understand what the vaccine was actually supposed to be doing because when somebody who was vaccinated then got COVID, then it was like, yeah, the vaccine is fake, which that wasn't the point. The vaccine was to protect you from serious illness. Mm. So I think during that phase, there was more of a positive shift towards people being more open about the vaccine. And even in my family personally, I mean, I'm a doctor. I, my family, I would hope, do trust me. Mm. But even in my family, I got a lot of pushback. My mom and my aunt didn't get vaccinated until I think towards the end of the vaccine rollout because they were just like, yeah, no, we're not too sure. Mm. We want to wait and see how it works on other people. And it didn't help that like um, people were coming with the side effects that like, you know, you could have clots and it's going to make you infertile. And I mean, whatever other myths that they came up with, with the vaccine, which again, if you're comparing it to Panado, if you actually look in that box, that side effects list is like 50 so I've seen, long. I've seen this, right? Yeah. Where people like basically yeah. lay the paper out yeah. for it's the long. vaccine versus a Panado. I'm like, yeah. um, I didn't know about the Panado. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because <laughs> I don't think there was a consciousness to go, you know what? I need to understand what I'm putting in my body. Yes. When you were just taking generic drugs that yes. you were taking from the pharmacy. Yes, yes. But where did the sudden consciousness to yes. go, wait, but what's the side effect? Yes, yes. And I mean, I think the thing is, though, like historically in general, like even with vaccines that are well established, there are a lot of people who still don't vaccinate their children, for instance. I mean, I think last year, mid-year, there was like an outbreak of measles in uh, the south of Johannesburg, which again was fed by a group of people deciding they don't want to vaccinate their children, but get fake vaccine certificates to still send their children to the same schools that require them to be vaccinated, infecting other children. And the whole thing was no vaccines give you like what autism, all these random things. Mm. And I mean, again, I, I don't have an issue with people wanting to have information about the things that are going to be put in their body. That's yeah. entirely fair. But you need to also be sure that the information that you're accessing is actual legitimate information because there was a lot of fake pages and random misinformation. And beyond that, though, then you also need to be non-selective. You can't be, mm. I want to know 
A to Z about the vaccine, but anything else that you use, you're perfectly happy to buy and mm. eat. And I mean, even the concept of us eating in restaurants, you eat with spoons that somebody else ate with, but nobody cares about that. But now when somebody's saying this could save your life, now you want to fight, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Because I mean, even then for me in general, if you're saying you're okay with losing your life, taking your chances with COVID, then what's so bad about the vaccine? If the vaccine's going to kill you too, then sort of, are you, are you, it's not like a 50 50 mm. thing. Would you rather not lean towards taking the vaccine versus not? So there was a shift, and I'm really glad that the shift moved towards a positive direction yeah. um, when there was more information being shared and when people were going to get the vaccines and were saying, oh, this was my experience with the vaccine and I'm fine, you know. Yeah. Um, it's really, it's still sad for me, though, because I had a lot of friends, a very close friend of mine, my best friend from childhood, who lost her father just before um, the vaccine roll, oh no, in the vaccine rollouts, and he insisted on not taking that vaccine. Mm. And um, when he eventually did um, contract COVID, throughout that experience, I think about in the second week when he was sick, he then wanted to get vaccinated, but by then it was a little too late, and unfortunately he lost his life. Um, but I'm really glad that we did get somewhere with the vaccine. Yeah. And when you think about like the top three myths yeah. that you heard that were just absolutely ridiculous, yeah. b- besides 5G, which, <laughs> yeah. oh, goodness me, like, guys. Yeah. You know, you, you think about yeah. stuff like that and you're like, okay, but where's the logic? Yes. <laughs> but yeah. I'm not going to shame people for yeah, that. But of course. were there, you know, just like ridiculous myths that yeah. you heard and you're just like, yeah. where is this even coming from? Yeah, yeah. So the first one is definitely the infertility one. Like, I was just like, I, I, I remember when I, because during, in my own capacity on my YouTube channel, when I was still active on there, and on my Instagram, I was trying to share, like, vaccine information and, mm. you know, use my platform to share, to encourage people to vaccinate during that time. And I was getting, like, comments like, yeah, well, it's fine, you took the vaccine, you're not going to be able to have kids, now you're infertile, ha, 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 you're oh, silly. Man. Like, really silly things. So does the infertility thing that for me was just like, okay. Um, the second one, I think, was cancer, where people were just like, oh, somebody got vaccinated, and in this short period of, period of time, they now have cancer and they died. Oh. Which was just like, but do we not know, like, the basic evolution of cancer? Like, yes, mm. there are quite a few cancers that can kill you quickly, but even then, it's not like over one week. It's mm. a graduated period of time. So that was the second one that I think just didn't make sense. And the other one was brain tumors, which I guess is also cancer. But like somebody was like, no, you're going to have brain tumors or dementia or something like that from mm. the vaccine, which also is something that develops over a long period of time. So somebody saying somebody was losing their mind because they took the vaccine and automatically that's dementia to me really just didn't make sense so those were the three ones the 5g one i think was actually probably the most popular one but yeah and that's also funny for me because they're like oh they're gonna track you with the vaccine but it's like yeah but they track you with your phone every day <laughs> <laughs> no no people don't want to hear the logical <laughs> like let's not have that argument yeah, right yeah, like yeah. the fact that you give up all your personal information yep, to your phone all your preferences mm-hmm. and the phone's listening when yeah, you're just and you hanging talk about out you're like oh you know that bmw is nice next thing you every ad. ad on your phone is <laughs> The, and you, and it's wild because you might not have even mentioned the name of the BMW, but now you're seeing I the BMW swear, that you I like. I swear, I've thought it's about crazy. something and it showed up on my Instagram. Yeah. I I don't think I'm crazy wild, for it. Wild, so But I guess already. for someone else, that might sound the way other people sound when they yeah. talk about the vaccine. No, it's but like, that at least has like some evidence to it. That's like, true. Because there's no person who can say they said something in the vicinity of their phone and it didn't show up. Like, yeah. everyone has had that experience, so... Yeah, at least there's some evidence with that. That's but true. with these random other, they're tracking you with, like, and the thing that also I didn't get was how people were so ready to latch onto these radical ideas. But, like, the evidence about the vaccine, they refused emphatically. But these random 5G, how somebody's making some connection between Iraq and the war and America oh, and 5G, and you're like, yeah, that actually makes sense. But the vaccine on paper, that makes sense. You're just like, no, no, this doesn't make sense. It's crazy. Can you talk about like the impact that, you know, the vaccinations did have, yeah. you know, especially as like, you know, and I don't know why this phrase disappeared yeah. after things, you know, sort of went back to normal. Mm-hmm. But as a frontline worker, I thought yes. that was like such an important yeah, phrase. Yeah, and, like yeah. you had Ooh, people really it, respect 
<laughs> like healthcare workers at that moment. Really? I, I hated it. No, again, I hated it because we were suffering. Like it mm. wasn't like a, a fun experience for us. It was like, yeah, you're our heroes, but every day you're just like, oh, can I please not lose my life? So it wasn't oh, wasn't man. the most fun. Um, but I would say, wait, what was the question? Sorry. It's no, okay. I, I got sidetracked. So, you know, what did that, um, just having the vaccines and seeing it oh, roll the out difference and, like, it made. the difference yes, of the yes, experience yes, yes. as a healthcare worker yeah. you know you spoke about what it was like during yeah, 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 yeah. How what was it like after? different you know yeah. with the vaccine rolling out yeah, and yeah. you know yes people are still getting infected but yeah. it's a very different sort yeah, of yeah. experience I think the biggest testament to the vaccine and the vaccinations and how vaccinations have worked is literally how life is now. Like mm. people tend to forget I, 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 when I was posting um, about the campaign and I was talking about vaccinations and how life has gone back to normal, people were sort of like, yeah, COVID just ran its course. And it's like, no, but that's not what happened because yeah. even when um, we were going through the pandemic, if that was how it was supposed to work, there were many waves where it peaked and it dipped. And if that was COVID running its course, surely it would have ended in the first wave, the second wave, the third. It would have just ended. But that's not what happened. COVID phased out or COVID became endemic because of vaccination. And because the majority of our population, thankfully, chose to get vaccinated, everyone else who chose otherwise is now just covered by herd immunity. And that's actually what's happening is that they're okay because other people made the choice to get vaccinated. So it made a very big difference to us because firstly, with us, I think we felt more secure because you also were hoping that the vaccine, as it says, is supposed to protect you from serious illness. So even when you got COVID, you weren't as afraid as you would have been the first wave. Yeah. And with me, with my personal experience, because I got COVID in the first wave, the Delta COVID is when I was the most sick. And when I got COVID lo- end of last year, the last time I got COVID, I was perfectly fine. Like I was at home, yes, so mm-hmm. that I wouldn't infect other people. But it was like 10 days just chilling at home. It wasn't anything too serious. I just had a sore throat. Even the cough wasn't really there for me. Yeah. It was okay. So for me, even my personal experience with post-vaccination was a much better experience than I had without the vaccination. And even with our patients, we saw that a lot of the patients that were coming in, firstly, the number of people who were coming in who had like severe respiratory distress was much less. Mm. And even when people did come, they didn't need oxygen as much. Um, And yes, there were a few here and there that unfortunately still didn't make it because that's the nature of disease. Um, And some of them weren't vaccinated, but it definitely made a very, very big difference in the general numbers. And I think that was also reflected in the number of deaths and, you know, the number of hospital admissions that we were having for COVID. It dipped a lot after the vaccinations. You know, people now, you know, you have this normal now. Mm -hmm. And it's because of just like the work that was happening, you know, to develop the vaccine, have Mm. people be more, you know, vaccinated. Mm. Obviously, you know, the vaccine rollout isn't as intense now than it was, you know, at the time. Yeah. How do you think people should navigate, you know, still wanting to get vaccinated now versus then when, you know, all the information was out there and it was easy to just go down the road and you knew yeah. that there'd be some way for yeah, you, for you know, to get vaccinated. Yeah. yeah. How do people navigate this new normal mm. um, to still, if they really want to still go back to that and go, hey, yeah. I actually want to, you know, correct this thing. Yeah. Because maybe the misinformation isn't as high and yeah. I really want to navigate differently. Yeah. So um, vaccination sites and like the availability of vaccination in public hospitals is still very much there. So mm. every, I think I work at a clinic, like a basic clinic, not even like a community health center. And they have a person who's permanently there every day. The only thing she does is vaccinations. That's all she does the mm. whole day. So in public spaces or public healthcare spaces, they still providing vaccinations freely and you no longer have to do the registration on that Sisonke site also mainly because that was more part of the study Mm. so they're not necessarily doing that anymore they are doing follow-ups where you can like answer questionnaires they'll send you a message to you know try follow up but um it's no longer a whole it's not as blocked as it was before where Mm. it was like a very in process, this is how it works, this is how you get vaccinated. Now you can walk into any public facility and request vaccination mm. and you can. And they are still trying to promote vaccinations, for instance. I mean, I think it's a little bit like of a, a mean incentive, but in public hospitals for the chronic patients, when they come fetch their medication, 
there's a pharmacy mm. that provides them with like medication with a much shorter line mm. if you get vaccinated. <laughs> so you, and these yeah. little things are yeah. the things that I think will make people yes, go, you know yes, what? Yes, yeah, yeah. Because I've had a few patients be like, oh, I heard about that line, the shorter line, because the pharmacy <laughs> line is long. Like yeah. it can take you four hours to get your medication. If you go to the vaccine line, it's half an hour. So it's, it's funny, but it's a really good incentive and it works. And when you think about just like, you know, the same thing with just like a shorter line in a public hospital or like versus not being vaccinated and having a longer line. Yeah. Are there ways that, you know, being vaccinated has sort of affected or impacted you, whether it's like accessing opportunities or navigating the world that we're in? For me so far, not necessarily because, Mm. I mean, I'm still working in the public health care space, so I haven't needed to find a new job or anything. But I have had a friend who recently needed to travel and they Mm. still needed to provide a COVID vaccination certificate. So I know when you travel, you do need to be vaccinated. There was an event that I went to towards the end of last year where... Um, even then, people were still pushing vaccinations. You had to provide proof of vaccination to attend the event. So yeah. there was that as well. And I know some jobs are like requiring people to be vaccinated for them to um, get employed, which I think is fair. I mean, I think also because over and above it being about having that vaccine certificate, it's also for your own protection. I mean, if yeah. you're going to be going to a place where there's a lot of people and you're unvaccinated you and you might have COVID, because also now everyone sort of is still trying to navigate the I have flu, is it flu, is it COVID? Oh, weird flu? Is it flu, is it COVID? Weird yeah, flu? exactly, weird flu. There's and, a weird flu currently and going around. And they're like, And oh, everyone's just like... Last month, there was a weird flu that was making everyone <laughs> sick. And I was like, you people just probably all have COVID. Weird flu, what's a weird flu like? <laughs> so, yeah, um, there's. I think there's still a lot of places where they still expect you to be vaccinated and it's for your own protection and Mm. the protection of others. Because again, people um, are living life and like in the, like when we're still deep in the pandemic, there's many people who were insisting on not getting vaccinated, insisting on not wearing masks, insisting on doing this, that and the other who may have infected somebody that died. And I mean, for me, with a person, uh, being a person who I would hope has a good conscience, like, would you not care about that, that you could make somebody else sick? Yes, for you, you braved the weird flu and you're fine, but Mm. what could you have done to somebody else? So, you know, I think there are a lot of settings and just in general life, because the vaccine half-life, it ranges between six months and 12 months. So the one that's six months, um, nine months and 12 months that you need to get your booster shots. So there is still a role for you to, like the annual flu vaccine, get the vaccination because you're still trying to keep yourself protected from COVID, especially if you're someone that has a comorbidity. Maybe the rest of us will probably fare okay without the boosters, even though I would encourage people to get them. But I think for people that are um, have comorbidities, it definitely should be a part of your general lifestyle to want to get your vaccine boosters or to at least get vaccinated. Because I also, when I posted my uh, COVID post, there were quite a few people in my DMs, like quite a few people who I respect, who are like, yeah, um, I still actually want to get vaccinated for COVID because I just got a fake certificate. I didn't actually get vaccinated. Uh. So where can I get vaccinated, you know? So there are a lot of people who are on paper were vaccinated, but in reality just went and paid someone for the certificate. So. That's that's a very scary, like, yeah. choice to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I recently got my booster. Yeah, yeah. Um, very simply, you know, yeah. uh, went to Discam. Mm. It was a 15-minute process. Yeah. And, like, the after effects was just a little bit of fatigue, yeah. you know, for the day. But yeah, yeah. Otherwise, pretty much nothing. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there, you know, something that you can say to people that probably haven't gotten their booster? Because mm-hmm. I do think that um, with the you know, reduced consciousness about COVID because mm. everything just feels so much more normal now. Yeah. Um, people are just like, ah, mm. things are okay. Yeah. Why do I need to do this? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And maybe I think we've forgotten that this thing is still here Yeah. and it's not necessarily just like gone. Yeah. 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 I think like that's just, that just comes from being conscious. Cause like mm. recently they were speaking about China, the, COVID cases in China are peaking again. So China's having a really hard time trying to get on top of like their co- the COVID um, general like lay of the land of COVID there because sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's not so bad. They still are having a good amount of people die from COVID even mm. though they do have vaccinations continuing to roll out. So I think just being conscious and recognizing that in other places, just because right now things seem to be fairly okay, it doesn't mean like last month when everyone had the bad flu, 
that the COVID cases are not rising again and falling. So I think being protected in general, it's like many things where you can prevent something before you get it or um, limit how sick the thing is going to make you. I don't see why anybody wouldn't see that as a positive thing because peace of mind is something significant that the vaccine affords you. Once you've had your booster, even if you're exposed to COVID, you have a lot more peace of mind as we had when we were working in the trenches mid-pandemic that, okay, at least now I have some protection, so hopefully this isn't going to mean the end for me. Because, you know, when you think about it, I mean, it makes me so sad that so many people died from something that didn't exist two years ago. Mm -hmm. And now we have a way to make sure that we try to protect as many people as we can, then why wouldn't you take that opportunity? Because I think people really do need to realize that life is short and it's important to value your life. I think because human beings take life for granted so much, like you're so accustomed to, I go to sleep, I wake up, I make it through the day, I go home, I wake up, repeat it again. Um, there isn't any assurance that you know, you're know you going to be alive forever. So yeah. I think if there's something that you can do to try and make sure that at least one base is covered, that you don't have to worry about serious illness with COVID, then take it. You know, I think it's just being responsible and caring about your own life, which in general is like I work in a chronic clinic and like the main thing I'm always just saying to patients today, especially I had so many patients who just weren't taking their medication. And one of them was just like, oh, aren't you going to try and preach to me about how I was oh. like, but... Firstly, in my mind, you're older than me. And beyond that, this is your life. And this is a patient I've seen at least three times this year. And I'm just like, but I can't keep trying to beg you to care for your own life. And I think that really, honestly, in general, was what the vaccine rollout message was also trying to say is that like this is about you caring for your own life and mm. trying to take a precaution to try and protect that life because once it's gone it's gone so i think people just need to value their lives and if you value your life then you'll make the decisions that you need to make i mean the annual flu vaccine is optional because you know influenza isn't killing us like and this is another thing people now are like oh i have flu like it's something that doesn't matter but influenza was a proper pandemic that killed millions of people and mm. now because of vaccinations and all of that now flu is just flu you know so i do think that it's just one of those things that you need to be an adult about making a conscious decision um and a decision that's important to save your own life so how do people you know now in this Post normal because I don't think we are post COVID. Yeah, COVID we're not. Is pretty much it's here. still there. Still here. Still there. You know, this post normal world. Mm. How do I navigate? Do yeah. I go back to mass just to as a precaution? Yeah. You know, I've gotten my double dose. I've gotten my yeah. booster now. Yeah. You know, how do I navigate this post normal world when it comes to this thing? So I would say, um, in general, depending on the vaccine that you get. Also, it's important for you to be informed. So just try figure out Pfizer, yeah, Johnson & Johnson, the other variants of the vaccines that are available now. Just try and find out if this vaccine lasts, how long does it last? Is it mm. six months? Is it nine months? Is it one year? Am I supposed to get a booster? Do I not need one? Because especially now that it isn't like a nationwide, this is what we're rolling out, this is the plan. And with that um, Sisonke rollout, there was a... SMS you would get to say now you're supposed to go get your booster no one's going to do that for you anymore so it's as much as you're making the decision to go get the vaccine booster to go get the vaccine then also be conscious enough to ask if you need to get a booster how often do you need to get it most of them now it's about annually so once a year you go get your jab and you're fine so I think it's just trying to make sure that when you do go get it also try have the information that you know you're going to need so that you keep up with your vaccine boosters and for as long as COVID cases are still rising and people are still dying from them then you make the decision to go get those vaccinations and when COVID becomes like the flu and it's just another thing now as mm. many diseases do especially with vaccinations then you won't have to worry about it after that but i think for as long as we do have to worry about it then just make sure you have the right information about the vaccine you're getting so you know when you should be going to get your boosters last question because i really wish we could have like spoken about your creative work yeah <laughs> outside of like this yeah. like very serious yeah. part of you yeah how important is it for you to have this creative outlet it's, outside of like uh, just like 
okay, I am yeah. healing. I am, yeah. you know, this is my purpose. Saving lives. Saving lives. <laughs> oh, wow. Frontline worker. <laughs> uh, no, uh, for me, actually, like fun fact, I had wanted to become a presenter when I was younger. So before, around the time I decided I wanted to be a doctor. Bonang? Like Yo TV, you know, I, yeah. I was very. I mean, obviously, that's when I was growing up. So for me, <laughs> my my goals then was Yo TV, but there was no Bonang during that time. So um, I was like really interested in mm. television broadcasting, being a presenter. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and then my parents were like, "No, you're too smart to go be a presenter." And at the time, my parents were super religious. I'm Seventh Day Adventist, so um, the one thing my mom was super worried about was that they were going to pierce my ears, which is just so ironic because I ended up doing it myself anyway last year, <laughs> <laughs> even though I didn't become a presenter. So for me, um, I started my social media or content creation journey in medical school, and that's just because medical school was so heavy; it was really difficult, and I needed something that was mine and something that I would enjoy doing yeah. and again I wanted to pursue that creative aspect in me without the pressure of like it's a full time job or anything of that nature I mean not even like I had those opportunities but I wanted to be able to pursue those things and to see where it took me and I mean I guess over the years it's grown and um, I think I've become better at it and I really do enjoy it and when I do get the chance to create content and you know um, engage with other creators I really enjoy it and I think it's a lighter it can be heavy sometimes, but I think it's a lighter um, aspect of my life. So I really, really do enjoy it. And um, I do hope that over time, like my biggest, I wish I could do, I really wish I could have like a medical show. Like I really, 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 like really, really. No, no. Well, n- n- anything <laughs> actually. I wouldn't okay. mind a podcast, like anything. Like mm. just have like a show where I can have guests and like talk about medical things and, you know, different things. Like mm. the doctors, that show that was on SABC3, I don't know. Uh, there was a Dr. Oz and like all those oh, people. I remember yeah. these, yes. Yeah, so I really wish I could have one of those in my mm. lifetime. I, I think I should probably try to figure out making a plan to do it. But yeah, I do enjoy it. And I think it also, for me, something that I've really enjoyed is being able to marry my love for medicine um, with my creative side because yeah. it also gives me the ability to share important information. Like one of the things that I'm most proud of in my content creation or my content, um, I don't know, package or whatever, the content arsenal that I have is I made videos on uh, female reproductive health Mm. that had like different diseases and different things people should be screening for things people should be looking out for and just like general information like about periods and stuff for little girls you know that maybe growing up and maybe don't have somebody to have that conversation with them I'm really proud of that body of work because it Mm. seems to have made a very big difference and I think it's been a great way for me to reach more people and help more people which I guess is in my nature so yeah I really enjoy that aspect of my life and I think I wouldn't trade it for anything that's amazing. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. To access previous episodes of this podcast, but also again access to other shows on our network, please visit lucha.com.